Hi folks, it's Andy. Welcome to this week's Kendo Rant. Here we are for another fantastic week of questions. Well, we've got some great ones for you today. We're going to jump to them in just a moment. But before we do, before we do, like, share, subscribe, you know, the YouTube stuff. It can help someone start Kendall. Did you know that? You can, you, I'm talking to you, you can help Kendall get, become more popular in the world by sharing, subscribing, liking, putting a little comment under here. Wow, this video is amazing. It's the best one on YouTube I've ever seen. Something like that. And there might be a chance that somebody that doesn't do Kendall yet sees it. And then they'll go, oh, what's this Kendall sort of thing? And they go down the door and they love it. And you just added to the Kendall community. If everybody watching this video did that, just imagine how many people we could encourage to do Kendall just with this one video. So do it. <laughs> Most importantly though, Support the channel by shopping at kendostar.com. Kendostar.com is the best Kendo equipment website in the entire known galaxy. Solar system, universe, multiverse, all of it. Of course, I would say that though, because I own the place. But everybody agrees with me. Everyone agrees with me. We're the best rated. Everyone's shopping there already. I'm sure I don't even need to tell you because, you know, I know you're smart people. And you'll be shopping at the best place as it already is. But just in case, shop at kendallstar.com. <laughs> okay, right. <laughs> Friday. It's Friday. It's Friday. Okay, let's get to these questions. Hi, Sensei. Thank I think you talked a little about Mitori Geiko. Can you elaborate on what to watch, what videos to choose, how to determine which player's style suits you best and how to get the most out of Mitori Geiko? Thank you for your work. Um, yeah, so Mitori Geiko is watching practice. So like uh, whether it's like watching other people at matches, at tournaments, <clears throat> or even in the dojo, um, it's it's a really important element for us that uh, sort of trying to improve at kendo outside of Japan. Obviously, like if somebody starts kendo in Japan, you know when they're like six or seven years old, they're surrounded by kendo, and they're probably doing kendo three or four times a week, possibly more. By the time they get to eight or nine years old, they're probably doing it four or five times a week. Um, they've got older senpai, um, and some of them are. <clears throat> obviously like successful kendoka, they've got high level senses, they're going to a shiai every week. So even if their dojo isn't super strong, they're going to a shiai and they're seeing the strongest kendoka in the region. And they're sort of learning kendo through osmosis in that re regard, right? We don't have that luxury. <laughs> so we have to make up for it with Mitori Geiko, okay? Because we don't get to just be at the tournaments or whatever where you have the best players in the region every week, like uh, like many of the, the you know, kendoka in Japan do. So um, you have to improvise. Now we've got this wonderful resource, YouTube, uh, that has pretty much all of the matches on there now these days. You know, all of the main tournaments are up on YouTube. Um, so you can do a lot um, <clears throat> to help yourself by using YouTube as a fantastic resource. It doesn't have to be Shia, it doesn't have to be tournaments. It can be gradings, all the grading, lots of gradings are up there. Lots of, lots of, you know, lots of stuff's up there. Um, and in terms of what you should do and, and, and how you should do it, um, watch as much as you can, first of all, uh, of all different things, but watch the best and the highest levels, all right? So All Japan Championships, Seven Dan Championships, Eighth Dan Championships, um, these, these are excellent starting points, to be honest. Um, because what you're going to, what you, what you've got to really look at by looking, you know, uh, by watching those is you, you, you're presented with examples of literally the, you know, the best Kendall guy in the world, um, sort of 
performing Ippon, <laughs> you call that Hotsu, uh, and helping us get an understanding of how we can achieve something similar. You also get an understanding of what is kind of recognized as you call that also a valid strike and what isn't. So for in, in the first instance, I'd say that. And then the next stage is to try and sort of, as you said, dis- determine what kind of Mitori Geiko and how you can apply it to your own practice. Now, the first thing you want to do is you want to look at how these players move and you want to do your best, tr- you know, try and build a mental picture in your mind of what they do. So it's not just happening. You know, don't just watch it and go, oh, yeah, that was a good point. Oh, that was a good man. Something like that was cool or amazing, whatever. It is, of course, appreciate it for that. But also burn an image in your head of what it looks like so that you can then take that image to the dojo. And then when you're doing your kihon, you know, okay, right, well, I saw this uh, fantastic men uh, on on, you know, whatever championships. I'm going to try my best to make mine look like that. And if possible, video your own practice as well uh, so that you can compare it. And then as you start to be able to do that, then you need to start doing that, particularly with with, with uh, competitors that are more applicable to yourself. So, for example, somebody that, um, you know, I've, I've been very, very influenced by players uh, such as uh, Takanabe Susume Sensei, for example, or uh, Nishimura Hidehisa Sensei, for example. Um, maybe, uh, who else? Um, Yone Yuichi Sensei, for example. Um, and as much as, like, for example, um, and Miyazaki Masahiro uh, Sensei as well, of course. Um, because these players are... Uh, of course, they've all got Kendall that's fantastic. That, and it's not limited to those guys either, but um, those players have all got um, fantastic Kendall uh, in itself, but also they're similar sort of height and build to me um, rather than, you know, obviously, like, for example, I, I, obviously I'm a massive fan of Ega Naoki Sensei's Kendall, absolutely massive fan, but I'm not built like him. Um, so my Kendall doesn't really look like, I mean, it doesn't look like the other guys either, in, in fairness, but I haven't, you know, uh, doesn't necessarily, I haven't necessarily drawn that much influence from from uh, from the physical movements of his Kendall, for example. Um, similar with somebody maybe like uh, Teramoto Shoji Sensei, for example. He's he's <clears throat> much, much taller than I am. Um, or Okido Satoru Sensei, for, for example. These are really tall guys. I'm not such a tall guy, so, so you know, um, it's uh, it, it's not it's not that it's not relevant to me though, you know. And there's lots that I can learn from. So I've I've learned, you know, of course, I still learn from those players as well, um, and and there's things I can take. And there's, there's others that have had massive influences on me too. Um, I, I'd, I'd say I've I've drawn massive influences from from those players, for example, or from players like um, uh, like. Well, like those guys really um maybe even uh some of some even even some of the sort of women's players as well um murama Ch- uh, chinata sensei for example um s- some brilliant stuff uh shimoka mika sensei for example absolutely brilliant player um and one of my favorite senseis in the world of course is o- ogata yuki sensei, sensei so um you know uh you, you have to draw a lot from lots of things but at the same time you have to try and find, you know, especially if you're starting to get serious and especially if you want to get serious about competing. Um, but it's not just that, though. Um, then it, it's a good idea to try and find a player that has Kendall that not only you really, really um, admire, but also is somewhat applicable to your own sort of situation. All right. So like I say, there's not a lot of point in me trying to just totally copy, let's say, uh, Uchimura Sensei or, or Ega Sensei or uh, Katsumi Sensei, something like that, because they, those guys are like 165, something like that, height-wise, um, or like Teramoto Shoji Sensei, for example, like I said, really tall guy. It's not necessarily directly applicable. And it's not to say I couldn't learn from him. I still watch him. I still watch him. Watch as much as you can but then try and figure out what's going to work more for you. Um, and then also about how the, not just the waza itself, but how they interact and deal with their opponents of different types. Okay. And uh, next one, good day, Sensei. I'd like to ask your opinion about gi material. Uh, personally, I like the soft and lightness of a synthetic gi, uh, 
but it seems that for formal occasion, we're supposed to wear uh, the 100% cotton type, like the Judogi, which is heavy, hot, and hard. In your opinion, which one would you recommend? Does the cotton one offer that much more protection and durability uh, that is worth it? And does the cotton soften over time? Thank you very much. Okay, so, so, um, first I'm going to do my sort of Japanese spelling correction thing. Lots of people say gi, it's totally fine, but just to let you know, the correct word for our um, upper garment in kendo is kendogi. Okay, it's kendogi. Some people use the word keikogi, keikogi, but actually the correct word uh, for kendo is kendogi, according to the Zen Kenmen. Okay. Um, anyway. <laughs> Uh, yeah, look, I really like the synthetic stuff as well. Um, I use it ev like for my everyday keiko. It's super, super uh, comfortable, super convenient, um, easy to wash, easy to care for. Absolutely love it. But yes, for a more sort of formal occasion, generally we're expected to wear a cotton one. Um, and yeah, traditionally these have been very heavy, bulky, not super comfortable, um, especially compared to like a synthetic one. Um, and like difficult to sort of wash as well. Um, so in general, I tend to work with um, the Kurenai that we sell on Kendallstar.com. Um, the Kurenai is a fantastic uh, choice because it's a very it's it's a hundred it's it's a full cotton kendogi. I was almost going to say hundred percent cotton, uh, but the kendogi is not technically hundred percent cotton because the outer layer is hundred percent cotton. But there's an inner synthetic mesh, so it has that same synthetic feeling against the skin. So it's much uh, it's it's much sort of softer and kinder to the skin. Um, it doesn't sort of abrase like cotton does, um, especially when it sort of gets wet. Um, and you know, uh, when you start to put hard work in. Um, so it's much, much better on your skin. Um, and the, and the, the fabric itself is, is the, the cotton fabric itself is, is also very soft. It's a, it's a very finely weave, very soft fiber that we use for the, um, for the cotton fibers that we use for it. Um, and the hakama as well is, is reasonably lightweight for a cotton hakama. Um, but it's got the, the pleat lock in it as well. So even though it's a lighter weight, um, cotton, you don't lose the pleats. Um, so it's like the best of everything. So, um, in the old days, of course, I used to wear these sort of big, thick double layer kendogi and these big, like sort of what, what's it? 10,000, 11,000, 12,000 mixed hakama. Uh, and we sell those as well. Like some people really, really love those still. And there is a nice feeling, I guess, of the sort of, that sort of, how can I say like this? It, it kind of gives a feeling of sort of solidness, right? Um, you know, so we do have like the Kimbush series for that. But for me these days in training, I'm using our um, Kachi, which is a synthetic one. And then like at formal stuff, uh, Shi'ai or seminars, or like if I go to the next grading, I, I use the, I, I use the Kurenai. Um, cause it looks, it looks a bit, but it's like super comfortable as well. <laughs> it's that easy to look after. So that's my advice. <clears throat> Uh, next one, Handy. What do you look for in a Nidan versus Shodan grade, and what are the common mistakes to avoid? Okay, so um, this is a good question. It's one that I get a lot. Um, it's one that's uh, kind of interesting. Um, so look, the, here's the way I look at it. Right, the way I look at it is that um, standan third dan is like a hundred is worth a hundred points. All right, you have to score. Let's say, let's say. All right, let's say let's say it's out of 100, right? And then you have to score 95 to 100 points to get Sandan. And then you have to score sort of 70 to 75 points to get Nidan. And then you have to score 50 points to get Shodan, I guess, is sort of a similar. I, I, those figures I've just pulled off the top of my head. I said, I said this sort of thing before and I might have said different numbers, but you get the idea. Right, the idea for Shodan, Nidan, Sandan, the criteria are all pretty much the same. All right, you have to be able to make strikes that are um, with Kikentai no Ichi and fulfill the criteria of you called that otter. All right, now by the time you're Sandan, you should be showing a um, obvious uh, sort of grasp um, and somewhat level of mastery of. Kentai no Ichi and strikes that reach the criteria of you called Atoto. Um, and you should have a have a, a grasp of 
a, a variety of waza or an ability to perform a, a variety of waza. Shodan, you should be able to make strikes with kentai no ichi, that means with fumikomi generally. Um, and, and that are somewhat, you know, close to reaching the, the criteria of you called Dasotu. Um, and then obviously Nidan is sort of in between those two. So it's like a, it's like a journey. Yeah. <laughs> it's a journey um, to Sandan, right? Once you pass the Sandan, okay, right. You've done the basics. All right. That's the, like, that's the, that's the story mode. And then once you've, once you've completed that, once you've got your Sandan, then you're into the end game activities. All right. So that's where you're, that's where, when you start to get into the real Kendall. All right. Um, and it, it's sort of, you know, you do do all that. Once you get to fit Dan, you pass your fit Dan, that's when the real work begins. Uh, and you start to have to look at what Kendall really is in order to go keep going forward. Now, um, so for Nidan, look, I'm looking for, if it was me, I'd be looking for someone that, um, you, you've got to make strikes that have for me coming. Have to. Um, every time, every strike has to have it, um, with like, obviously the obvious exceptions, like if you do like Kaishido and Nukido, they don't necessarily have to have it, but in general, generally speaking, your, your strikes should be, um, good strikes with Kikentai no Ichi, um, and with Humikomi, um, good understanding of Zanshin, not just hitting, running off to the distance with your back to your opponent, um, and, um, starting to sort of, you know, rather than just, yeah, step in, men, yeah, step in, men sort of thing, start to demonstrate that you can, you, you, you know, more than one waza. <laughs> it's probably a good start. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and the, and, and then make sure that you, you know how to do all the day haul, make sure that your ball is tied properly. Um, and you're, you're wearing your uniform properly. Um, it, I, some people might say I'm a bit too strict, but like if, if you're not tying your men more properly, um, like, like different lengths and stuff, um, probably not going to pull you up on it being like a vertical knot instead of a horizontal knot. But I, sh I think we should, but we, I don't think it's necessarily realistic to expect that. Um, but like you can at least have them the right length, right? So if you've got dead long men here more and the different lengths and stuff like that, yeah, I'm going to fail you for that. Um, to be honest, don't care how good your, your kendo is. Um, it's easy. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, that sort of thing, uh, obviously know the kata, um, and, and, and that's basically it. Um, I think the biggest mistake people do is for some reason when they get into grading, they do this sort of thing where they go, man, and they run off, man, like this with the sort of back up to their opponent like this and turn around and they're miles away and they have to run back together. Yeah, man, and they're off again. Like, <laughs> shouldn't be like that. All right. Right. Next one. Andy, you mentioned that on the Akatsuki Bogo, there is an option to have the Uchiwa made with cotton or a synthetic mesh. Would you mind expanding on the two materials a bit? Why might someone choose one material over the other? Does one material perhaps work better with one sort of skin chemistry, etc., etc.? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's not a huge difference. <clears throat> it's not a massive difference. You get a little bit more durability out of the cotton rather than the, um, the mesh, um, especially if you have any sort of facial hair. Um, or you're sort of prone to growing facial hair, um, cause that can abrase it a little bit. Uh, otherwise uh, the, the mesh is a little bit softer. It's a little bit more comfortable. Whereas the, um, the cotton's a little bit rougher. Once you get on, you're not going to notice it all that much in fairness. Um, mesh dries faster. Um, and it doesn't stain you, whereas the, the, the cotton one is eyes on my dyed, so it's likely to stain you a little bit. All right. Um, <clears throat> otherwise, it's kind of personal preference. If you want something that feels softer and dries faster, then the mesh is cool. Um, if you want something that's a bit more traditional, probably a bit more durable, um, then you go with the cotton. Uh, and that's that's about it. There's not a, it's not a huge difference. It's, it, it's really not. It's not it's not like, oh, wow, it's so different. It's, it, it, it's, it's a bit different. 
when you're wearing the men doing cake, we do not notice the difference. <laughs> okay. Uh, next one. Hi, Fisher Sensei. One day I would love to go to Japan again. I miss every time I leave. And while there, I would love to train in a dojo as a guest. I realize it varies depending on the dojo, but on average, what sort of training regimen can I expect? And what big differences between Western and Japanese dojo should I be prepared for having trained in a Norwegian dojo for nearly four years? Okay, that's a really good question. I think it's something that a lot of people think about. Um, it is very dependent on the dojo. It's very dependent on the dojo as to what sort of training uh, they do. But for the most part, for a large part, in adult dojos, <clears throat> so if you go to like a machi dojo, like a, a local dojo, um, they might have like a, a, a kid's training and then a separate adult's training. Um and it depends. A lot of them, it'll just be an hour practice and it's just jigeiko. You might do two minutes of like, you might do one kirikaishi. It's the most popular, the most common in my experience, practice uh, like menu for adults in Japan is one hour of jigeiko. <laughs> and that's it. All right. Because most of the guys there uh, and girls there are experienced um, it's not uncommon to go to a dojo where everybody is at least fifth or sixth dan or higher. Um, if they're all adults, you might have one person who's one or two people who have started kendo a bit later and they might be second or third dan, uh, or even beginners. But for the most part, if you go to like an adult practice, it's not, un it's not unusual that everybody's sixth and seventh dan. Um, it's not unusual. Or maybe if there's some younger guys, they're fifth dan. Um, so they just do an hour of jigeko. Um, some will do like some kihon as well. Depends how long they've got to practice, to be honest. But um, what you'll find as well is it's often done as like a kind of motoda jigeko, so like a shido geiko. So the senseis who are like seventh dan or eighth dan will normally stand as motodachi, and then everyone else will queue to practice with them. Uh, is the most common way, but it's not the only way. It's not the only way. You just have to go and s sort of go with the flow um, and see what happens. It depends on the dojo itself. There's lots of different types. Uh, next one, greeting sensei. What do you think the future of kendo will be? Let's say in 50 years from now, do you think there'll be more emphasis on competitions? Can you imagine any scenario of change, even if gradual? In any way, it is taught or practiced. Um, of course, it's going to change a lot in the next 50 years. It's changed just in the last 20 years. Um, and it's changed even in the last, I'd say in the last 30 years. Um, yeah, in the last 30 years, I think Kendall's changed quite a lot. If you watch like um, some Kendall from the sort of early 80s, um, or uh, which is 40 years ago. <laughs> in the last 40 years, it's changed quite a lot. Uh, <laughs> from like the early 80s, um, yeah, um, late 70s, early 80s, and you watch it something from the mid 90s, it's changed, it changed quite a lot. There was a, there was a big shift in the sort of uh, late 80s, early 90s in competition kendo, definitely. Um, I have my theories as to what that was, don't really want to go into it, but um, there was, there was, there was a change. Um, for the better, in my opinion. Um, there's been, um, and the, there's been continual changes. And of course, things have changed recently, right? They changed the rules recently. And I don't, and I don't think they're going to go back. Um, so, you know, yeah, I think things will change. And it wouldn't surprise me if, if in, yeah, in 50 years, it, it's not going to look massively different, right? But it wouldn't surprise me if like, there's, 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 probably, you know, a much, much less emphasis on, um, Tuba's IDI, for example, maybe it's gone, could be, um, and, and, and that sort of thing. It's not going to be like electronic and stuff like that in my imagination. I don't know. can't imagine I'll be around to see it, but we'll see. Uh, <laughs> who knows? Um, more emphasis on competitions. I don't think so. I don't think the emphasis on competitions has changed all that much over the last, over the last, 30, 40 years. Um, I think what a lot of people don't understand, like if you've only done kendo outside of Japan, and when I say done, I mean, I don't mean like been to Japan and done kendo there for a week. I mean, like if you've lived in Japan and done kendo there um, and been involved in kendo there, 
you'd know. But, um, you know, for those, you know, I think what a lot of people don't understand is like for 90% of the Kendo population, like the main thing Kendo is, is competition. <laughs> it is competitive for like 90% of the population of Kendo in the world. Um, because they're kids and they're doing Kendo in Japan. And that is the goal of their kendo is to win the sh win shiai. Um, maybe not ninety percent because probably there's probably plenty of kids that um, nah, but it's, it is, isn't it? Even like you know, the, there's sorry, there's no, there's no, there's no thirteen year olds that are trying to develop themselves through kendo uh, into into sort of more evolved human beings or some stuff like that. Um, they, they've got to win the matches. Um, and especially those that are at very serious, um, you know, uh, Kendo, uh, institutions, um, then it, their, then their, their, their life and how their life will play out is affected by it. So it's, it's extremely important. And I don't think that that's necessarily considered a bad thing. And I don't think the, um, I don't think the, the Zen Kenden is, a, has a problem with it either. Uh, I think what they have a, a problem with is when, is, is when, um well how how kendo is performed in those competitions uh, they're not they're not adverse to kendo being you know having emphasis on competitions um because they're not looking to reduce the number of competitions at all um so uh what what they are keen to do is to ins is to ensure that the the being the Zen Kenden and being in charge of the direction in which Kendall goes and being obviously governed by um, experienced senses that, that do have an understanding that, of, of Kendall that, that the rest of us might not, um, then of course they do want to modify or, or, or how can I say, like guide the, the conduct of competition so that it, it maintains um, true to the uh the principles of what kendo is is supposed to be about um but in terms of removing emphasis of competitions i don't see that being on the agenda for the for the world japan kendo federation at all um so you know you know when sort of people sort of kind of sort of say oh kendo's not about competitions it's not an important part that it's a massively important part um <laughs> um and for 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 the majority of kendo in the world it's the main thing um so yeah um don't imagine that changing um it, it will change how it's taught it has the way it's taught has changed as well uh, and potentially the way it's practice practice changed as well i mean you know society changes right society changes as well so i don't i i wouldn't like to speculate how it might uh might change what direction it'll go but um I do imagine that the, the it will look somewhat different, though I don't I don't think it will be totally alien uh, either. Um, I think you know I think if I went back or if any of us went back, you know, fifty years, um, we could engage in kendo practice with the people of those times. Um, it might be a little bit different, but we could still engage in practice. It wouldn't be completely alien, and I think the same would be said for for going forward into the future. Uh, next one, hi sensei. Could I ask? you to talk about the role of breathing in kendo do you inhale before a strike is that a telegraph how do you get your breathing under control when you're tired and shiai uh, is there a special kendo breathing for different circumstances appreciate your time as always thank you um so yeah mm. breathing is always one of those things that's sort of talked about a lot i think it's probably like over mystified a little bit you know like there's some sort of secret breathing technique like you know <laughs> What is it? It's like a demon slayer. Is that is that what it's called? It, um, in English, the Kimetsu no Yaiba. It's in Japanese. There, they've got the, you know, Mizu no Koku and stuff like that. The water breathing technique or whatever. <laughs> um, the uh, um, no, um, I, I don't think it's it's not it's not like that. But anyway, um. Obviously, you have to regulate your breathing. The ideal situation, right, is that you're not sort of breathing before a strike. What you don't want to do is inhale before a strike, okay? So, okay, I'm going to strike. That, you don't have time for that, okay? Instead, yeah, and kind of hold in the breath. Now, I, I sort of do it subconsciously. 
I sort of do it subconsciously. So I'm not like going, right, I'm going to hold my breath down mm, like this. But I have to do it sub- subconsciously so that I can strike immediately. Like that. What I can't do is go, like that. I don't have time for that. All right. So I have to have to regulate my breathing. And I, I do it, like I said, I do it subconsciously. If, if, if I need to breathe again, then I'm going to make sure I'm going to do it when I'm in a position that I'm not dangerous. You know, I, I'm not I, I, in danger, I should say. Um, so, you know, but I, there isn't a, like a special Kindle breathing technique sort of thing. It's just, you know, think about it logically. If you have to, if you have to take a breath before you strike, because you've got to shout to strike, so you need your breath then that's going to that's gonna slow you down, isn't it? All right? Um, so it, it's just a case of practice um, and concentration. And the reason people struggle in Shi'ai is because it's through lack of experience. So the, 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 the experience of Shi'ai itself um, is kind of nerve-wracking and that tires you out in itself and makes it difficult to breathe. So that will also improve with more experience of, of participating in Shi'ai. Okay? Uh, in Kendall Feedback, episode 20, around the 11, 26 mark, you were explaining the broken rhythm thing. I was hoping that uh, if this doesn't kind of put you on the spot as such, you could give more of an elaborate de- demonstration uh, of the same, how to practice it and what uh, it would look like in Jigei or Shiai versus Shinsa. Thank you. All right. So um, I think it was a grading video, that one. I did go back and look at it. Um, and I was talking about how the candidate, like they did a, a brilliant fifth down exam, I think it was, they passed it flying colours, no problem. But I was saying that for going forward, they were tending to always attack in the same rhythm that was like from far distance, yeah, and one, two, three, step in, attack kind of thing. I think from memory, yeah? Yeah, men, okay? Yeah, kote, kind of thing. Um... Or even if they step in, even if it wasn't in that sort of rhythm, yeah, step in, kote, step in, men. And it wasn't like, it was It was easy for the opponent to kind of, it can be easy for the opponent to kind of catch. Whereas really what you need to be doing is using your asabaki and your shinai to create a rhythm that's different, not to create a rhythm in a way, but to break the rhythm so that it's it's difficult for your opponent to understand when, when the threat is really there and when it isn't. So if I was to kind of step in, then I'm using my shinai to obviously touch their shinai, take center, things like that. But at the same time, I'm using my footwork to move, but in in an irregular pattern. So I'm not going to just go, yeah, man, this way, I'm going to be kind of like, pam, pam. Withdraw a bit, then back again hit the shinai man like that so it's, it's hard for them to to catch the timing of what i'm doing it's hard to show on here but you know so i'm not like always attacking in the same timing and and it, it's hard and what i what i i have done in the past you know when i didn't really know what i was doing was i'd have a tendency to step in and then step in again or like just with my right foot and kind of Okay, like this, and it's more like, I'm going to hit now. And I was doing the opposite. Whereas now, I'm trying to be more, bring my left foot with me. You know, I'm exaggerating a bit because I've only got a small box to work in. Yeah, I'm not I'm not doing this sort of thing. Yeah, I'm moving my body to do it. To, to kind of break the rhythm so I'm not always attacking in the same pattern yeah and so the opponent doesn't really know what I'm doing you know I'll be like this maybe hit from above on the shinai pam this way send me this way send me this way hit from the side this way this way or something like that do you know what I mean like just kind of mix it up a bit yeah you don't want to just always go at the same rhythm uh, okay, last one. Hi, Sensei. I've been unable to attend practice for the past couple of weeks due to illness, so I've been trying to do more Mitori Geiko. Good. Uh, and that leads me to the question, uh, to me, this looks like Aimen, or if anything, maybe Red hits first. I'm assuming that White is given the point here because in, uh, they initiated the attacks by moving in and putting pressure on their opponent, forcing them to do something in this case. Cut men. Or am I not seeing this correctly? Thank you. Okay, should we have a look at this video? 
Okay, so here's the video. Uh, let's watch the uh, let's watch the bon. I'm not sure if you'll get the sound or not. Probably not, but let's have a look. I know this match. This is from the All Japan Championships final from a couple of years ago. Okay, this I mean, this is white. <laughs> this is white. <laughs> um, there's a couple of reasons why it's white. Okay, I understand what you mean. It looks like I mean, all right. Especially if we slow down the full speed clip, right? It looks like I'm in here. Yeah. It looks like I'm in. It's not I'm in. Uh, <laughs> all right. Um, they're going to show it in slow motion in a sec. I think it's from Kendall World. Um, first off, the rule book says, um, it's not the rule book actually, it's the handbook for Shi'ai and Shimpans. It's like the, the guideline, the, the handbook for how you should, how you should use the rule book. Um, it says that as a general rule, there's no such thing as Aimen or Ayuchi. All right. So you should, of course there is, but you should act as if there isn't. All right. So it means that in such a situation, you have to judge which is the better one. Um, if both are good enough, would not in, if both would as isolated strikes would be good enough for you called that you have to judge which one is the better one. Um, or if only one, then you have to, judge which one it is um in this case it's white um for a couple of reasons first you're correct in that the white takes the initiative um they take the sen all right they do the shikake all right so this waza happens because white mr hoshiko um is able to uh force a reaction from his partner from the semi here, he starts to move. His, his opponent has sort of started to step in, but I don't think they'd started to actually strike here until he started the strike here. And then he's like, okay, we better go. And because of that, this Shinai is touching. This one is not. Okay, this one's not quite touching. This one is. Okay, it's hard to, it's hard to see that in this blurred bit, but this one is there before that one. Now, in real time, you can't see that. You can't see who hits first, right? But if we watch the waza in, in if we watch that waza in in full uh, full speed. Yeah, it's it's the white ipon. Okay. It's the white ipon, uh, and it's it's because the shimpan aren't just watching the hits. All right, the shimpan are not just watching the hits. Um, they are watching. The whole match play out, all right? So they're watching the beginning, they're watching the middle, they're watching the end of each waza. And the shimpan, from their experience, is why it's drastically important for uh, shimpan to be active kendoka and preferably active shiaisha. Um, they're able to um, interpret the flow of the shiai to make a, a, a judgment and almost, not preempt, but understand what is likely to happen yeah you can feel or see when an ippon is on its way okay um and for waza like this that's essential information that they need in order to make the decision on whose ippon it is uh and if i remember rightly um if i remember rightly this this ippon was awarded with three flags instantaneously um to uh to the white player Okay, um, there was no, there was no, uh, what do you call it? Um, it wasn't a split decision, all right? So all three of the Hachidan senses, who are all active kendoka and still actively involved in competition, all right? This is Funata Sensei, all right? He's won the Hachidan tournament. Um, I'm not sure if he still participates, but uh, he definitely still participates in things like the Tozai Taiko, all right? Um, the East West Championships. Yeah. Bam, they knew straight away which one it was. And all three of them got the same, just came to the same conclusion, right? Uh, and that's the reason why. Okay. Um, so, yeah, it's hard, but that's why it is massively important for Shimpan uh, to be active Kendoka and also active competitors. Um, to give a bit of personal experience, um, it's hard for me to participate in, in Shi'ai these days, 
Okay, there's not many Shia, uh, and um, you know, once once you get to a certain point in Kendall, uh, it, it's it's difficult to enter smaller Shia as a competitor. Okay, you're expected to enter as an official, but um. You know, uh, I've obviously retired from mainstream competitive Shi'i, uh, national team stuff like that. But I will I have been luckily uh, selected to Shimpan uh, European Championships coming up in May, um, and knowing that, of course, I'm I'm practicing kendo with that in mind, and um, I'm even entering Shi'i with that in mind, um, even if that means traveling to different countries. Now, I mean, you know. Um, I, I might not have always have the success I want in the Shi'i, <laughs> uh, but it, it 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 allows me to keep my skills sharp both for my kendo and for my ability as a shimpan, um, and you you find it often correlates. Uh, at least I found so far it often correlates. Um, the best shimpan um, tend to be also active, uh, both in. Uh, you know, keiko and in shimpan, uh, in, in shiai, uh, even if it's, it, obviously I'm not saying like every week, but like they, they don't never do it. Um, and those shimpan that you think like, what? <laughs> they tend to be the ones that are a little bit hands off. Um, just a pattern I've noticed. Um, and it's one of the reasons I think, I'm just rambling now, it's one of the reasons I think it's really awesome. I went, I went to, as I say, I went to Shi'ai reasonably recently. I went to the French Open Championships a few weeks ago. That was cool. Um, uh, had some fun matches um, with some Japanese universities kids. <laughs> Thought I'd get to fight some, some other Europeans, but ended up fighting the Japanese kids. But anyway, that was cool. Uh, <laughs> It was fun. Um, but one of the great things about that uh, tournament is they've got a seventh dan division. Um, and obviously, you know, I know there was some controversy surrounding that, but, you know, in, in any in any case, the, the seventh dan division itself means that those higher level uh, senseis are, 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 are still participating in Shi'ai. Um, so, yeah, um, it's it, it, it's good that, that, that that's happening. And, and I'd encourage and hope that more we see more of that, uh, and that it's 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 done so on a on a on a more um, frequent and open basis. That would be awesome. But yeah, cool. Um, there we are. We're at the end of the show. <laughs> uh, thank you for joining me today. I hope you've got lots of candle planned for the weekend, and I hope you have a great time whilst you're in the dojo. Uh, do your best, and uh, see you next week. Bye bye.